Welcome to this online lesson and battle map presentation on the Battle of Balaclava, 25th of October, 1854. There's not to reason why, there's but to do and die, as the famous Tennyson poem says. And that is related to this topic. So if you are watching this as a history student, I hope that this is useful to you. Equally, if you are watching this as an English literature student studying Tennyson's famous poem, Charge of a Light Brigade, equally, I hope that this will give you the context that you need to succeed with your studies. The main aims of today, though, are to know the main events of the Battle of Balaclava, to explain the importance of different factors relating to the battle, and to evaluate the impact of leadership on the battle. First of all, though, as a bit of a starter, have a look at this famous image at the top. This is a painting called the Thin Red Line. We're going to revisit this source later in the presentation. Consider the weapons and tactics at Waterloo, and the weapons and tactics that were typical of the 18th and 19th centuries. I've got videos on those topics if you've not seen them already and you want to brush up on it. However, what formation are the infantry in and why this form might this formation be surprising given what's going on? If you want to have a go at answering those questions, pause the video now and when you want to hear the answers, press play and we'll continue. Pause now. Alright, hopefully we identified that those soldiers are standing in line formation. Ordinarily, that would be an almost suicidal move against cavalry, which might make it surprising. Although, as you can see from the picture, although very few of the cavalry are shown, they do appear to be being beaten by the infantry. The reason for this will become clear as we proceed through this presentation. We're going to get some contextual information first. First of all, a new technological development, the minier ball. Okay, that's a French word, I might be mispronouncing it, but that's how it reads to me. In the Napoleonic Wars, early rifles like the Baker rifle were hard to load because the rifling got fouled by burnt gunpowder. Remember, the rifling is the grooves inside the barrel that make the bullets spin. The bullets needed to fit tight into the barrel to bite into the rifling and spin, and that made them hard to push down the barrel with the scouring stick or ramrod. But in the 1850s, a new invention changed this. A Frenchman invented a new bullet called the Minier ball that was small enough to drop down the barrel like a musket ball, so quick to load made with a hollow base or skirt that expanded in the barrel and conformed to the rifling on, fi on firing. Have a look at the image in the bottom right. You can see the skirt and, and hollow base of these bullets there. You imagine the explosion going off behind that would just push out the sides of the bullet enough to conform to that rifling. It was also aerodynamically shaped, so it travelled much further and much more accurately. Your tasks then. Explain why the Minier ball was better than earlier bullets. And then... What effect might these advantages have on tactics? Pause the video now. Alright, what did we come up with? Hopefully we identified that the Minier ball has got all the advantages of firing a musket ball in terms of the speed and ease of loading with all the advantages of accuracy of the rifle. That made rifles far easier and quicker to load. What effect might that have on tactics? Well, bear this in mind. If they can reload quicker, and if they can start shooting at an, an enemy accurately and at a longer range, it means more damage can be done while an enemy is advancing upon a line. So, for example, a line of infantry might be able to shoot at advancing cavalry in a move that otherwise would have been suicidal given the inaccuracy of their weapons, how long they took to reload, and their maximum range. Perhaps that gives us a few clues as to what the thin red line painting was all about at the start. It really should do. Let's move on to the Crimean War. A little bit of context for you. The Crimean War, 1853 to 1856. Before I start this, you can get much more detailed versions of what started the Crimean War in other videos, I'm sure. However, suffice to say they are largely very complicated, often quite boring, and unless you're studying the Crimean War in detail, you really don't need to know any more than I'm going to tell you now, especially if you're just studying the Battle of Balaclava. With that said, let's have a look at the basic context. In 1853, Britain and France were becoming concerned that the Russian Empire was expanding too much and threatening their ally, Turkey, otherwise known at the time as the Ottoman Empire. In 1853, a French, British and Turkish force landed in the Crimean Peninsula. The biggest army in this force was French, but Britain sent significant numbers too. Despite some early successes, such as at Alma in 1853, the Russians held on, and the war dragged on too. French and British troops surrounded the Russians at Sebastopol, sometimes spelt as Sebastopol, 
but it was a constant struggle to keep them supplied. In fact, as we'll find out, this is really the birth of trench warfare. Parts of this, this war around Sevastopol looked quite a lot like the First World War, not something that happened 60 years earlier. The main British base was at Balaclava, and it was attacked by the Russians in the Battle of Balaclava on October the 25th of 1854. The commander of the British Army, Lord Raglan, oversaw a victory, but there were serious mistakes too. Though the British, French and Turks won, the war showed serious problems with training in the British Army, but also tremendous progress in medical care, mostly down to the efforts of Florence Nightingale. It was also the first accurately reported war. William Howard Russell witnessed some of the main events and wrote about them in the Times newspaper. This was widely read by the middle and upper classes of the time. It only took five hours for his stories to reach the UK by telegraph. Again, another feature of new technology. Roger Fenton was a pioneering photographer whose photos of the war shocked and impressed the British public. This helped turn people against the idea of war. Now, if you'd like to, you could create a quick who, what, where, when and why summary of these events. Or you could just make your own notes in your own particular way. Or you could just carry on. If you want to make some notes, please press a pause now. Or if you want to continue, let's go. Our case study today is the Battle of Balaclava. Here's what it was all about. The Battle of Balaclava was fought on the 25th of October 1854. The Russians attempted to charge through the British and French lines and destroy the vulnerable base at Balaclava. Balaclava was a natural port or harbour where the British were getting most of their supplies. So if the Russians succeeded in capturing it, the war would be as good as lost for the British. In short, the Russians were stopped from capturing Balaclava but not without serious Allied losses and shortcomings. The battle was characterised by three particular moments, two of legendary steadfastness and courage, the Thin Red Line and the charge of the Heavy Brigade, the other of famously suicidal stupidity and incompetence mixed with a tragic bravery, the far more famous Charge of the Light Brigade. On the next screen we're going to have a look at a map that shows the events of the Battle of Balaclava. I'm going to have to do this in one take, so if I stumble over a few words, I hope that you'll forgive me. Also, this will be rather simplified in some ways, but in terms of giving clarity as the main events in the battle, it should be perfectly sufficient. On to the Battle of Balaclava. First of all, let's get an idea of who was in charge of the different elements up to the battle. The British chain of command looks something like this. Lord Raglan was the overall commander of British forces. He's the one pictured, and yes, he is missing one of his arms. It's one of Roger Fenton's photographs, by the way. As the overall commander, his force was split into two main groups. The infantry, a reasonably small force of about 500 men under the, uh, the command of Sir Colin Campbell, comprising the 93rd Highland Infantry. These guys were professionals. They were big hairy Scotsmen, basically, and I wouldn't want to get into a fight against them. Lord Lucan, on the other hand, commanded the other section of the army, the cavalry. The cavalry arguably played the majority of the part in this battle. Sir James Scarlett was in charge of the Heavy Brigade. These were heavy cavalry who acted as shock troops. They were slower and more heavily armed and used for attacking enemies who were either in position or enemies uh, who were also on cavalry. And then there's Lord Cardigan in charge of the Light Brigade. These were fast cavalry for scouting and chasing and particularly for chasing down enemies after they had been uh, defeated. So before we have a look at the map, just note down and copy this chain of command. Secondly, consider this. The officers in charge here, and by officers I mean people like Lord Raglan, Lord Lucan and so forth, had all bought their commissions. This means that they had paid money earlier in their lives to become officers and often paid money to promote, be promoted as well. It does not mean um, that they were necessarily promoted based upon merit. This is quite different from even the new model army of a couple of hundred years earlier. Why might this make the quality of those leaders inconsistent? Pause the video while you take down the information that you need to. Or if you'd prefer, we'll carry on to the battle map now. First of all, let's consider the battlefield at Balaclava. Yes, it's another one of my Microsoft Paint drawn maps of very low quality. Nevertheless, it should give a fairly clear idea of the main layout of the battlefield. The main features of the battlefield are the South Valley and the North Valley, separated by the Causeway Heights. There are roads leading over the Causeway Heights and one leading to Sebastopol. Balaclava and the British base itself is shown to the south. 
I've only included a small part of the town and the natural harbour here, as no, the fighting did not in fact reach Balaclava. In terms of the main other features, we have a canal and river up towards the northeast, and we have heights to the west and to the north as well. Let's consider where Raglan deployed his forces. First of all, Raglan himself was positioned on the western heights, giving himself an excellent view down the North Valley, the South Valley, and indeed down the Fedukeen and Causeway Heights. He could even see down towards Balaclava and Can Roberts Hill as well. In fact, in fairness to Raglan, he could barely have chosen a better place to position himself. However, there was one problem with this. He was quite remote from where his troops were actually positioned. Therefore, getting orders to them and making them clear would be difficult. He would have to rely on runners with horses uh, to take handwritten notes to the commanders who were more engaged in the actual fighting. But let's see where he positioned his soldiers before the battle. First of all, we have the 93rd Highlanders, the Thin Red Line. These were 550 elite soldiers of the British Army. Volunteers and professional soldiers, they were tough Scotsmen. Just imagine big beards and kilts. However, this only made up a part of the infantry force which Raglan was able to call upon. In addition, the British had brought cavalry. There was the Light Brigade, led by Lord Cardigan, and the Heavy Brigade, led by Lord um, Sir James Scarlett. The Heavy Brigade, remember, were the heavy cavalry that were supposed to launch attacks upon uh, the approaching Russians, whereas the Light Brigade was more of a reconnaissance force for spotting them and scouting them, and for chasing them down should they retreat. A small section of French cavalry also accompanied the Light Brigade. The next big feature were the redoubts. These were held by Turkish soldiers. It totally wasn't their fault, but they were poorly trained and very poorly led, and they were likely to be very outnumbered. Nevertheless, uh, Raglan decided that they were the best men to man the redoubts, which are small fortresses, on top of the Causeway Heights and Can Roberts Hill, as he wouldn't need to rely on them to manoeuvre in battle. They could just stay put, take up the best positions they could, and resist as well as they could. A redoubt is just a small fortress with a few cannon in it and positions for the soldiers to fire at approaching enemies. Notice how these redoubts are designed to blunt any Russian attack from the north towards Balaclava. Additionally, there were 26 British guns on top of the heights above Balaclava. So, a summary of the forces. There were 2,000 infantry, most of these being the Turks. There were 1,500 cavalry in the heavy and light brigades. 26 field guns above Balaclava. And finally, the thin red line in line formation as a last line of defence north of Balaclava. The plan here is that the Russian approach is likely to come from the north. The Causeway Heights and the Redoubts would likely blunt their attack, and should they get through that, the Heavy Brigade under Sir James Scarlet would be able to hit them in the flanks if they tried to head towards the 93rd Highlanders, who would mount the ultimate defence. Should the Russians choose to retire, the Light Brigade were well placed to chase them down the North Valley, or indeed across the Causeway Heights, as was the job of Light Infantry. And yet, like many plans, and as is often the case in war, the plans are all going to account for nothing once the battle actually begins. So let's see what the Russians were going to do. The Russian deployment was as follows. Firstly, 25,000 infantry were tasked with the main task of taking Balaclava itself. Yes, this was a huge force. The Russians were not as well trained as the 93rd Highlanders, but they were very much the equal of the Turks and massively outnumbered them. Again, it's, we're talking in the region of 10 to 1 here or even more. Not only that, the Russians had brought two large sections of cavalry, totalling 3,000 cavalry in all. The Russians also outgunned the British and their allies, bringing 78 guns, some of them heavy 18-pounder guns made of bronze, which were positioned in the North Valley. So the Russian plan was to take the redoubts, their cavalry could then punch through, defeat the 93rd Highlanders, and the infantry could follow that up by capturing Balaclava itself. Should the British try to outflank them from the rear, the Russian cannons in the North Valley and on the Fedukeen Heights could deal them a crushing blow. So a pretty simple uh, approach here, but very little is simple when it comes to war. So let's consider the first part of the battle. The capture of the redoubts. The Russian infantry took possession of the redoubts with very little resistance. Poorly trained and poorly led and massively outnumbered, the Turks, and who can blame them, decided to retire back towards Balaclava. It is possible that they could have been rallied for a final defence there if it was necessary, but that in fact, in the event, didn't necessarily uh, wasn't actually necessary. 
Now, the thing is that those redoubts now became Russian positions. The cannon were left behind, as was much of the ammunition. And given that cannon were all loaded in more or less the same way back then, the Russians were perfectly able to operate them for themselves. So not an, an exactly strong start for the British and their allies. However, things were about to improve for them in a quite unexpected way. The next part of the battle was the Thin Red Line. We'll come back to what that, uh, the origin of that phrase is. Here, the 93rd Highlanders had to face down a section of Russian cavalry. They were stood in line formation. Now, the uh, military wisdom of the time suggested that line formation against cavalry would have been a mistake. It was more traditional to form square against cavalry so that the horses could not break in amongst the men and finish them off. However, this was not possible. If the men had stood in a uh, square formation, the Russian cavalry would simply have been able to go around the outside of them and straight into Balaclava. That was not what the British were looking for at all. Instead, the 95th Highlanders spread themselves into a very thin but long line, only two men deep. They were banking on their new rifles, not muskets, rifles, having the range and the power that if they were able to bring them all to bear at once, it should be sufficient to stop the Russian cavalry. Let's see if it worked. The Russian cavalry advanced, and the 95th Highlanders loosed off three volleys. The second volley started to slow the Russian advance, and the third at point-blank range, backed up with a blast of cannon from the top of the heights above Balaclava, was enough to stop them and then turn them in panic and retreat. Although, significantly, the Russian cavalry did not actually leave the battlefield. They took up a position behind their artillery and regrouped. This was to become significant later on. Nevertheless, the thin red line of 93rd Highlanders had done their job well. When Sir Colin Campbell had said to them, There's no retreat from here, men. You must die where you stand. And the men had replied, I, Sir Colin, and if needs be, we'll do that. Well, as it turned out, they didn't need to stand there and die. They were able to stand there and win. So where does the name thin red line come from? Well, accompanying Raglan on top of the Western Heights was William Howard Russell, reporter from the Times. His long dispatch to the Times, which was published a few weeks after the event, uh, but actually communicated back to London within a few hours of the battle, is one of the best sources we have to understand what happened that day, although it's not perfect. From his view atop those Western Heights, he was able to look down on the thin red line and he described them as looking like a thin red streak tipped with a line of steel, describing the men's bayonets glinting in the sunlight. This phrase later got shortened to the thin red line and has subsequently become a metaphor for the army itself, that thin red line metaphorically separating a country from its enemies. Let's consider the next event, the charge of the heavy brigade. This is one of the points that where Raglan was left quite frustrated. The second phase of the Russian cavalry attack charged over the Causeway Heights, but were unexpectedly met by the heavy brigade advancing up the hill to, uh, to intercept them. It's very likely that neither side realised that the other was there at this time. Rather than imagining a galloped charge into each other, uh, Sir James Scarlett's heavy brigade were a little more than a trot at this, this time. However, they had surprised the Russians, and despite the, the fact that the British were outnumbered in this instance, they managed to hit the Russians in the flank and make them panic. That meant that the Russians retreated. However, an opportunity has been lost here. Lord Cardigan, at this point, should have intercepted the Russian cavalry as they retreated, or indeed joined in the fray with the heavy brigade. However, Cardigan, having not received orders, gave the order to hold their ground. And naturally enough, Raglan at the top of the hill must have been incredibly frustrated to see Rag uh, Cardigan lose such an obvious opportunity to finish off the Russian cavalry once and for all. Cardigan was a brave man, but he was not real well regarded for his intelligence at the time, even by people who liked him. But he was going to pay a price for his inaction, which even he could not have predicted. And that's where we come on to the most famous part of this entire battle, the charge of the Light Brigade. The battle by this point is pretty much over when Raglan gave an unclear order which was delivered even more vaguely and which was then interpreted badly. The result was that Cardigan's Light Brigade charged the Russian cannon at the end of the North Valley. All the way, the Light Brigade became under Russian artillery fire from three sides, which was pointless and suicidal. Before we look at that, though, let's try and understand why that order was so badly misinterpreted. Let's have a look at it. Here is the order. 
This is a copy of the original order written on a piece of paper in pencil by Colonel Richard Airy, who was acting as a, an assistant to Lord Raglan. Have a go at reading it. You're struggling, aren't you? Well, even though the people back then would have been better able to read this, this style of handwriting, it's actually still unclear, even when you, you've got every word. So I'll read it to you now. Try and follow it along if you can. Lord Raglan wishes the cavalry to advance rapidly to the front, follow the enemy, and try to prevent the enemy carrying away the guns. Troop horse artillery may accompany. French cavalry is on your left. Our airy, immediate. Now, this note was passed to a man called Captain Nolan, a junior officer of some ambition. He galloped down the hill towards where Lucan, the commander of cavalry, and Lord Cardigan, the commander of the light brigade, were waiting to receive orders. He handed this piece of paper to Lucan, who then handed it to Cardigan. They both read it. They couldn't understand what order they were being given. So they asked Nolan which guns were, were intended to be attacked. The truth is, Nolan probably didn't know. He gestured vaguely with one arm in the direction of the Russian cannon and said, There, 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 there are the guns, sir, and you are to take them. Not helpful. For, you see, the only guns that were visible to Cardigan and to Lucan were the guns at the bottom of the North Valley and on the Fedukeen Heights. Raglan had actually intended for them to take the guns on the Causeway Heights. These were guns that had been abandoned by the Turks and which the Russians were busy setting about capturing and loading up and taking away. Raglan was desperate that these guns should not be lost as they would be needed in any future defence of Balaclava and the Light Brigade was the perfect unit to take care of them. On sight of light cavalry, the Russian infantry would simply have retired and left the guns behind. But these guns were not visible to Cardigan, even though they were visible to Raglan, and so Nolan's unclear order only muddied the waters still further. And so we go on to the charge of the light brigade itself. Charge begins. At this point, we get the sense of Tennyson's poem. Cannon to the left of them, cannon to the right of them, you know, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. And fell indeed they did. One eyewitness describes Captain Nolan galloping up the side of the light brigade as it advanced, apparently noticing that they were heading for the wrong uh, target and not the one that Raglan had intended. However, he himself was killed by a cannonball before he was able to countermand the order. The slaughter would have been even worse if it wasn't for the quick thinking of the French, who were able to attack and disrupt the cannon on the Fedekin Heights. However, the Russian cavalry were able to countercharge the Light Brigade, and their tattered remnants retreated back through the North Valley, again receiving fire from all sides. In effect, the Light Brigade was wiped out. Let's have a look at the aftermath. So... The charge would have been worse without that fr uh, quick thinking from the French, but it was still an absolute disaster. Out of 673 men of the Light Brigade, these are the 600 men that uh, Tennyson describes in his poem, 113 were killed, 134 were wounded, and most of the horses had to be put down. It had achieved absolutely nothing other than to become famous in history as one of the most famous and pointless attacks of all time. But a brave one. After all, theirs not to reason why, theirs not to make reply, theirs but to do and die. So let's consider the overall results of the battle. Although the British did succeed strategically in preventing Balaclava from having been captured, it was a rather indecisive battle, with neither side gaining much of an advantage and both sides finishing more or less as they had begun. After all, the Causeway Heights redoubts had been abandoned by the Russians at the end of the battle and retaken. The main thing from a strategic point of view was that the Russian attack had been repelled by, the, repelled by the Heavy Brigade and the Thin Red Line. But the third phase had been a costly waste for the British and their allies. The Russians lost 627 men, the British had lost 615, and neither side had gained an advantage as things ended much as they had done before. And that is the story of the Battle of Balaclava. It's really, remember, characterised by three main points. The bravery and steadfastness of the thin red line in uh, defeating the Russian cavalry attack. 
The similar bravery of the heavy brigade under Scarlet, surprising and also defeating the cavalry, but that opportunity to beat them once and for all being missed. And with the brave but stupid attack of the charge of the light brigade, which has gone down in history as the most famous part of this battle. Let's move on and focus on a couple of points in a little bit more detail. Focus number one, the thin red line. One of the most precarious moments of the battle was the defence of Balaclava by the 93rd Highland Regiment against the vastly superior Russian cavalry force. The Highlanders formed a long line, two men deep. Normal practice was to form square against cavalry, as Wellington had done at Waterloo, but the Highlanders were on their own and had to stop the Russian onslaught. Not only that, they realised they had rifles that might have a good go at preventing the Russians from getting there by being able to shoot at them accurately at long range. So, let's consider this painting that we looked at at the start. This is a painting of the Thin Red Line, painted by Robert Gibb in 1881. The original is held, now held at Edinburgh Castle for the public to view. Remember that Russell described this as looking like a thin red streak tipped with a line of steel. The fact that so many of Russell's uh, uh, reports are remembered, and indeed form the basis of Lord Tennyson's poem, The Charge of a Light Brigade, shows how communications and an understanding of war was improving at this time, and that in itself is an important development. But focusing on this painting, let's do a real quick skills builder task. Remember this quote as well. There's no retreat from here, men. You must die where you stand. I, Sir Colin, if needs be, will do that. As a skills builder, read these two statements. The picture is of little use. It was painted 27 years after the event and so, co so can tell us nothing reliable or useful. Or statement B. The fact the picture was painted so many years afterward means that the event had long-term importance. Which view do you agree with more and why? Refer to how both statements are at least a bit true, but choose one or the other. If you want to do this quick, quick skills builder task, then take the time to do it by pausing the video now. All right, well, let's consider statement number one first of all. Remember, when we're dealing with sources and we're looking for usefulness, remember there are very few sources that are not useful unless they're completely unbelievable or if, unless they're completely irrelevant to your inquiry. So assuming that you are considering the, long, the, the importance of the tactics used at the Battle of Balaclava, well, you might say this is a romanticised version. It doesn't really give you an idea of the strength of the Russian cavalry. And it's too focused on this almost romantic image of the Scots standing there nice and steadfast. Therefore, there are some arguments to support statement A. However, statement B is probably the one I would go for. If you are wanting to paint this picture and provide this sort of message many years after the event, it shows that people still remembered this in the popular imagination and it was still something that the country was proud of. Otherwise, Robert Gibb would never have uh, done anything like this. And of course, his work with the Bee Gees many years later would not have been so well remembered. Hmm? Oh, oh, sorry, that was Robin Gibb, not Robert Gibb. That makes a lot of sense, actually, because he would have been over 100 years old when they wrote Staying Alive. Never mind that. Anyway, let's move on. Let's finish off with a quick summary of change in continuity. The warfare through time topic requires you to study examples of change and continuity across time periods. So let's see what relevant findings we have from the Battle of Balaclava. First of all, cavalry got less important. New long-range weapons like rifles and fast-firing artillery made cavalry vulnerable. Remember what happened to the thin, uh, with the Thin Red Line and the Charge of the Light Brigade. Secondly, artillery got more important. In the Crimean War, artillery got heavier and more powerful, leading to trench warfare at Sebastopol and events like the Charge of the Light Brigade. We've also got Cardwell's reforms to the army. This is something that we'll study in more detail in a future lesson. But officers after this period had to prove that they could do the job rather than pay to become officers. Ordinary soldiers also were treated better after this time. Fourthly, we've got the mass production of weapons. By 1815, at the Battle of Waterloo, the British Army was 62,000 soldiers and cavalry. At Agincourt 400 years earlier, it was a mere 6,000. This was made possible by the mass production of weapons. Also, we have new weapons. Rifling made firearms longer ranged and more accurate from balaclava onwards. Breach loading artillery, this means artillery that's loaded at the back rather than down the mouth of the gun, fired faster. And by the 1890s, bolt action rifles and machine guns have replaced slow muzzle loading guns. Again, there will be a future video on faster firing guns. Examples of continuity. Tactics changed fairly slowly. 
For most of the period 1700 to 1900, slow muzzle-loading guns meant that the line, column and square infantry formations remained basically unchanged. As a seventh point, Britain kept a standing army. Since the Civil War and the New Model Army, Britain had a permanent standing army. Despite Cardwell's reforms, class divisions remained in its leadership, and arguably, they still do. Number eight, cavalry remained an important part of armies. Though it definitely declined in importance, and this is a gradual decline across the entire period that we've been studying from 1250 onwards, cavalry was still a part of armies until well after 1900. World War I finally began to change this. Lastly, firearms and bayonets dominated. Although guns got more accurate and faster firing, by 1700 guns with bayonets were the dominant weapon on the battlefield. Bows, shields and pikes were long, long gone by this point. Sometimes centuries before. Remember that sh the use of armour and shields was already falling out of favour in Tudor times, two or even 300 years earlier than what we've been looking at with the Battle of Balaclava. With that final summary in mind, I will say that's the end of this lesson and this presentation. I'll say thank you very much for watching and I hope that's been useful to you. If it has been, please like the video and subscribe to the channel where new content like this is being uploaded all the time. Many thanks and goodbye.